My name is Buzz Marston. I'm one of the board of directors here at the National Corvette Museum. <coughs> if you haven't seen my face before, that's because you haven't been here before, but I've uh, been around a few a few years. But um, we're here to uh, talk about our favorite subject this morning, and uh, we've got the top of the line to talk about it. Uh, the 2018 Corvette. How many of you were inspired to buy a 2018 Corvette? Now, how many of you do think you'll be inspired to uh, buy a 2018 Corvette after you hear them talk? <laughs> there you go. Okay. You have your job cut out, guys. All right. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Taz Jutter. He's the chief engineer of Corvette. Harlan Charles, the uh, product manager of Corvette. And Ryan Vaughn, the interior design director. Gentlemen. Nobody's going to show up. <laughs> this might be the first time I'm right about something. <laughs> Since we got married, so hope somebody takes a picture of this crowd. Anyway, um, I hope it's not because you're expecting some gigantic reveal announcement. Here's Harlan. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, I appreciate everybody uh, getting up and coming in. Um, we're going to run through some slides, basically do what we have been doing really for decades uh, here at the museum at the Bash, uh, talking about the year in review and talking about uh, what's new for the uh, upcoming year. And there's a lot of exciting things going on, um, a lot of things going on in the plant. Uh, it's kind of a renewal of Corvette. It's uh, really exciting to see it and a lot of it's uh, due to uh, how well the car has been accepted uh, by people like you and, and people really all around the world. So we're really appreciative of uh, where the Corvette um, community has uh, taken us. So I'm going to start with their year of review. Uh, starting from a little over a year ago, uh, when we introduced the Grand Sport, this is in Geneva, Switzerland. So we're truly an international brand, uh, recognized all around the world, uh, decided to uh, reveal the Grand Sport uh, relatively early uh, in the life cycle and then a lot of that had to do with customers uh, like you guys uh, knowing that we did the Grand Sport on the sixth generation car and uh, really liking that combination and uh, basically asking for it from the moment we brought out the seventh generation car and so uh, we brought it out relatively early. Uh, Oliver Gavin and I uh, did the honors in Geneva and it was pretty, uh, it was really fun because we kind of stole the show and uh, there's a lot of really premium cars uh, introduced in Geneva. It's a very high-end show, a lot of very expensive cars and uh, there's a lot of like big, big all new uh, reveals there and uh, our little Grand Sport kind of took the thunder away from uh, some very prestigious marks uh, in, on their home turf. So that was uh, very exciting to do and very exciting to see the, the reaction that we got. And then truly, you know, we spent a lot of uh, last year introducing the car uh, to media, letting them experience it. And I don't think I read uh, one review that wasn't just glowing. Uh, people really, really liked the car. Uh, we did an organized event. We actually had Oliver uh, back at uh, the press event uh, showing people how to drive and uh, showing what the car could do. And then we let people have the car uh, to put it up against whatever they wanted to put it up against. So uh, Carmen Driver, um, you know, really, really liked the car. They, they talked about it being the sweet spot. And it, it really, if you, if you read all of these, it almost seems like this is the only Corvette to get. Uh, but they make it sound that way because it's really important to sell uh, magazines and bring uh, eyeballs to websites and stuff. So it's the latest and greatest thing. And we really believe it's the latest and greatest thing, but it's no disrespect uh, to a Stingray or a Z06. Uh, those are both awesome cars appealing in a slightly different way uh, to different customers. 
road and track. Uh, he should go fast, but not in the passive way a GTR does, so kind of automated. Uh, this is no video game. The GTS is, uh, is the Grand Sport GS is familiar and accessible in the right way. Top Gear, so internationally, this is the BBC, uh, European Top Gear. Uh, what's it like to drive? Instantly fun. Should I buy one? Unreserved, yes. And that was kind of a conclusion, like a bottom line, uh, from a bunch of uh, media. Uh, next one, ours and Technica. Should you buy one? The answer, we think, is a resounding yes. So uh, a lot of coaching uh, out there uh, helping us uh, sell cars. Uh, Grand Sport, here's a road track. Uh, jump up to the Grand Sport is absolutely uh, worth it. And uh, a lot of the feedback I get is the Grand Sport is a car that you never feel like uh, you have too much car. It's got incredible chassis capability, chassis capability you can use on the road, and still enough horsepower to keep it really entertaining. Motor Trend, uh, for a little more money than the base Stingray, you can have your dream Corvette that you can drive to the grocery store, a racetrack, a fancy restaurant, to a religious gathering of your choosing. <laughs> Serve religion here. Um, it can be your daily driver and your Sunday fun day car, need I say more. And we talk a lot in here about bandwidth, trying to make cars that can do a lot of different things uh, well, so it can fit into a lot of different lifestyles. And a review like that warms our hearts because it means the journalists really appreciate what we're trying to do. Then you get down to the nuts and bolts, kind of the, you know, how did it really perform? Uh, road and track, uh, performance car of the year, they got all the hottest cars uh, new to the market on track and uh, see what they can do with them. Uh, the Porsche 911 Turbo S, so that's just the Turbo, that's a Turbo S, that's a little more horsepower, that's about a $200,000 car. Uh, beat us by nine one hundredths of a second. Uh, that's all-wheel drive. Uh, Porsche obviously is an extremely capable car manufacturer and uh, for way more than double the price. Uh, they beat us by nine and one hundredths of a second. And you can see the other, like the NSX guys, have to be really happy that their brand new car, supercar, uh, came out uh, behind us along with the GTR <laughs> Nismo. So that's the hottest uh, GTR you can buy. So those are some cars with some real uh, track cred and uh, our grand sport uh, put them back in the pit. So really happy uh, with that kind of performance. And part of that is because it is really easy to drive and you hand the keys to somebody, especially the media, you're never quite sure who's going to be driving it. Um, and so it can be people of extremely high skill. Sometimes they bring in a hot shoe like Andy Pilgrim or somebody. Um, sometimes that's one of the editors, usually very capable drivers, but maybe not right at the leading edge. So if the car is a quick learn, um, beyond what it's ultimately capable of in a pro's hands. Um, if it's a quick learn in a, a quick shot like this, you give somebody the keys and take a bunch of cars to track. If it's easy, accessible performance, that ends up uh, showing in the final results. Motor trend, head-to-head uh, -head here, uh, extremely uh, competitive with the, the 911. So this is the best driving Corvette yet built. Borderline magic, they call it. Only problem, this is, this is great, I'm sure Porsche loved this too. The only problem is that I'd be daydreaming of driving the Grand Sport while I'm out grocery shopping in the Porsche. <laughs> Just get the Grand Sport, it's easy. Which is the better sports car? The answer by almost a second uh, in this was the Grand Sport beating the 911 by 0.82 seconds. Uh, here's Auto Guide, Reader's Choice. Um, Another selection, Grand Sport Sports Car uh, of the Year. 10 best, uh, we fell off 10 best uh, for a brief period and it almost never happens that, uh, you know, because they love everything that's kind of shiny and new, it almost never happens that if you're on 10 best and you fall off, you get back on 10 best with essentially the same car. The Grand Sport uh, was so compelling that it, it brought us back to uh, 10 best at uh, Car and Driver. And then, uh, same thing actually with Consumer Reports recommended by. I know a lot of people don't consult uh, Consumer Reports when deciding to buy a Corvette, but it's nice to have kind of a mainstream uh, media quality assessment uh, organization uh, put their stamp of approval on you. And how many people saw this at the uh, auto show this year? A few people? 
Okay, this is not a political gathering, so we're not going to talk politics. <laughs> but uh, just by coincidence, I was at the auto show, and you can tell it's a coincidence because I'm dressed like a slob, and everybody else is really nicely dressed. I had no idea this was going to happen. I was actually down at the Detroit Auto Show for uh, completely another meeting, and I noticed there was an uh, unusual number of bomb-sniffing dogs uh, walking around. <laughs> You don't usually see a lot of uh, German Shepherds at the auto show, but there was quite a few uh, down there. And so I was kind of cruising around, actually was headed over, I wanted to look at the Ford GT and see if I could sit in it and see if it was real. And I, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I uh, on my way over there, I happened to run into one of our communications guys, and he, he said, uh, you know what's happening? I was like, no, what's happening? He goes, well, Joe Biden's coming over to check out uh, Corvettes and other Chevrolets. And so I said, oh, that's cool. I said, can I watch? And uh, he's like, yeah, stand over there, stand over there. And so um, there was a huge crowd because everybody knew uh, he was coming. And uh, Mark Royce, you can see over uh, Joe's shoulder, uh, showed up. And uh, and I was talking to him a little bit. I said, that's great. You're going to show uh, Joe around. He goes, yeah, stick by me, stick by me. I'll introduce you. And so uh, I tried to do that, and uh, as he got closer, he was coming from the Ford exhibit, and he was surrounded by about 250 media, and then layers of security, event police, Detroit police, Secret Service, these waves of security were kind of leading the way through the crowd, and I had no ID, I had no badging, I had no credentials, I had no, I didn't even look like I belonged there. And um, so I'm trying to figure out how to get through the security, uh, and I'm trying to stand by the Corvette and, and hold my ground because I knew he was going to show up with the Corvette. And so I, uh, I'm standing there and this giant cop comes up and says, Sir, you have to move aside. And I didn't know what to say, so I just said, I just blurted out, I just said, well, I'm part of the show. And I, I, he goes, well, why didn't you just say so? So I thought, well, <laughs> man, that's, that's tight security for you. So anyway. <laughs> so, um, the whole crowd, you know, the media scrum uh, headed this way, and, and Mark Royce saw me, he kind of pulled me in, uh, and we just started talking about the car, and then Joe got in the car, and Mark said, why don't you get on the other side? And uh, so I jumped in the passenger side, and we shut the doors, windows up, sealed out everybody else, and had uh, about five minutes uh, with the vice president just to chat cars. And uh, I've walked a lot of politicians around the auto show, and I have to say, uh, Joe was unique in my experience. Uh, he was a car guy first and a politician second. Uh, usually the politicians are, they know where every camera is, they know the shot they want, they're positioning themselves, it's like a, a photo op, you know, I care about this, I care about the industry, you know. It comes off when you're like right there with them, it comes off kind of fake. Joe didn't hear anything about any of that. He was going off script constantly, you know, he's supposed to go from here to there, he's like, forget you guys. I'm, I'm going to stand here and, and talk to my buddies on uh, Corvette. So, really, really uh, cool experience. And uh, to me, he came off, uh, you know, as basically one of us, uh, a real car person. So, uh, I really enjoyed that. And he, he did say, you know, he was he was struggling with, oh, I'm going to be out of office. I'm going to be able to, you know, be able to actually drive myself. I'm not going to be chauffeured everywhere. He goes, What do I get? Do I get? Do I get a Stingray? You know, because he has a Corvette, he has, uh, I think it's a 67, if I remember right. And uh, so he's like, oh, I, I'd really love to have another Stingray in the driveway. He goes, but this great sport, this is so sweet. He goes, but I gotta drive this Z06, you know, I gotta check that out. So he was really struggling uh, with his personal uh, car decision and, and spending all the time uh, with us, uh, basically, to try to work that out in his head. So anyway, um, I offered my help at any time, you know, after he's out of office to, to get him into one. I haven't heard back from him, though. I'm sure he's uh, resting and relaxing after getting out of office, so. <laughs> Suggestion up here is uh, suggest, send him one of each. Well, we're not sending him anything. <laughs> he can pay like all good red blooded Americans. <laughs> Anyway, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the race season uh, last year. You know, we uh, certainly had our challenges. It's never easy. Uh, how many of you were at the race dinner last night? And you guys go? Was it good? 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, you heard from those guys. They probably uh, showed you some similar things. Uh, I think they're going to be around today. Around today, you talk to them some more. Anyway, awesome effort as always. Um, they leave it all on the field uh, every year. And when you hear some of the stories behind the scenes and some of the things they had overcome, you know, in the end, if you just kind of look at the highlights of the season, then it make it look easy, but it's not easy uh, by any means. And, and some of the struggles they go through to, to achieve the results for all of us is really, really impressive and inspiring. So that was last year. And then uh, this year we're off to a uh, pretty good start. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the 100 wins. Yeah, talk about uh, an amazing milestone. Uh, getting to 100 wins, uh, most race programs are lucky to run in 100 races. You know, they usually don't last. You know, somebody uh, gets the idea, let's go racing, it'll help promote the brand. They race for a couple of years and then it's discontinuous, it's expensive, it's hard. It's hard to be uh, consistently winning and if you're not winning, why participate? So uh, it's a tough sell and so to be in it long enough, consistently enough and uh, as competitive as we've been for as long as we've been to 100 wins is uh, really, really impressive. And then immediately we went 101, 102, 103. So uh, I don't know if we'll make it to 200, at least not while I'm still at GM, but uh, I'd love to love to see the, the successes they're having. So anyway, started off uh, pretty decently uh, this year and it's gonna be just like last year. It's gonna be hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat uh, all the way through the season. Uh, challenges with the balance of performance, trying to figure out the best way uh, to, to be, bring home the, the victories. But they're super inspired to do it uh, for you guys, for us uh, on the program, on the, on the people side. And I couldn't be happier with uh, the partnership that we have with Pratt Miller and Corvette Racing. Okay, so that's kind of the highlights uh, from the last year. Uh, I'm going to bring Harlan up next uh, to talk a little bit about uh, sales and some other information that's new. Harlan. This is the fun data part of the presentation where we get to look at all the, all the numbers. I know everybody likes that. So, but it, actually, you know, what Dad's talking about racing, you know, we compete in the showroom, I would say that, with all the cars that we race against and more. And this is the biggest uh, victory we have as being the number one uh, luxury sports car segment, you know, almost 40% uh, market share. And um, market's a little bit down from last year, but overall we're still uh, dominating as usual. And outselling by far all the Porsche entries. Everybody else? Uh, this is um, data. If you see, uh, we got Wendy Wynn Miller here, as she puts together all this data for us. That's a good job. Um, looking at, uh, this is as of uh, pretty much now April 4th, so we're getting you know, close to all the orders in for 2017. Uh, and you can see the, the new Grand Sport was 38% of the total Corvette did really well. That's, that's probably about, about what we thought, so we're really happy with that. And you can see the Z06 had a little bit of a later start, but still uh, rebounded very strong uh, on the Z06. And you can see, um, you know, it's kind of, as, as you'd expect, as we go up from Stingray to Grand Sport to Z06, you see the different trim levels, one, two, three, it seems to go up as you go up, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, this is some of the Stingray, Stingray data. You can see um, the eight-speed uh, automatic transmission, paddle shift, over 80%, so it really keeps going up and up. Um, and uh, the chassis, you know, we actually have four different possible uh, chassis with a Stingray. You have, you have the standard, you have magnetic ride, you have Z51, and Z51 with magnetic ride. And actually, as of now, the, the standard chassis is the most popular. A lot of people get the performance exhaust, and uh, red brakes are popular, and black wheels continue to be, to be, more, be popular on all the Corvettes. I see on the Grand Sport, uh, also almost 80%, uh, eight-speed uh, paddle shift. Um, one of the cool things, uh, again, red brakes, almost half of the cars get the red brake option. Uh, the Z15, that is our heritage package. Of course, the ha you know, the hash mark stripes and the interior uh, package that goes together. About a third of the Grand Sports 
had the uh, heritage package, that's pretty good. And about 20% got the center stripe too, so a lot of people having fun with all our, we're hoping we people would do that, you know, all the different combinations and things we introduced, uh, that people would really personalize their cars. Again, black wheels, also very popular. And then, then we get to the Z06, uh, of course. Um, and even, even on Z06, 70, 71% eight-speed paddle shift, also very popular. About a third of the cars had the Z07 package, and then the 18% of people are starting, um, you can get the uh, ceramic brake package without the Z07. So that started, that's gone up quite a bit as well. And colors are always fun to look at colors. Arctic white continues to be uh, number one for quite a while. But really, uh, the new Watkins Glen Gray really did well. The, the second highest color was black and torch red are always uh, mainstream colors too, very, very high. And the new Admiral Blue did well also. Interiors, of course, I mean, you know, you can't go wrong with jet black, but the adrenaline red will be the, the number two interior. Some more. Now this is like, we can, we, so you can look at this later, but we do get to put this data together. Um, it's kind of fun to see all the interior and exterior combinations. Like, like let's just take for example, like Ryan has a silver Stingray with Kalahari interior. That was nine, nine cars, yellow brake, so he's got a very rare car. <laughs> But, you know, it's fun. To, it's fun to look at the different the different com combinations and see um, and see what they are. So we've got some rare ones. Of course, usually one of the more popular ones. Of course, the, the white with the red interior is always pretty high, and uh, things like that. So one of the things we uh, were very proud of was the collector edition. Uh, we we are pretty close to our limit of a thousand. This data goes goes up to um, nine twenty six. I think we're actually have orders in for nine, I think we're 970 something as of now, so we're gonna get pretty close to the to the thousand. So this car, um, despite having a little bit of a late start in the year, it's been a big hit. We're really uh, pleased with how it, how it did. And you see the uh, only, uh, of the uh, 926 first ones, 150 were convertibles, so mostly coupes. Um, and also you can see mostly towards the eight speed, and the competition seats 266 out of 926. So we kind of keep some of the data, you know, on the special editions too for everybody. All right, what's new for 2018? I'm gonna have Tanj kick this off. Yeah, I wanted to give a little overview uh, just because of all the things that are going on. We've got a lot of moving pieces. Uh, the biggest deal, of course, is, uh, you know, we've announced previously uh, that we have to break the plant down to do a bunch of internal uh, upgrades. The biggest one, of course, is the paint shop. Uh, you guys have been seeing the paint shop go up. It's massive. Uh, we're really excited about the facility. It's the first time we've gotten a paint shop essentially custom designed and built to Corvette specifications. So it's not a generic uh, automotive paint shop. It's custom designed for our unique car, which has got a lot of things that are very unique about it, the way we process panels off. You know, we don't paint a car, we paint just a set of panels uh, on a big fixture, and they're all composites. And so there's a lot of um, things that are very specific to painting composites to get really high quality that are uh, very challenging, honestly. You don't want to bake them at very high temperatures like you can do metallic, aluminum, or steel panels. You want to bake them slowly, and that means you need to move through low temperature ovens and you need to move, uh, the ovens need to be really big because it takes a long time to, to get the, the panels through. So that's why the paint shop is as big as it is, is because it's really custom engineered to our requirements. Uh, we're going down between August and October, so three months, and the paint shop is, is just about done. But what's not done is all the connections inside the plant. We've been producing uh, the current car uh, in the old process exactly as it's been and the new paint shop is like at the opposite end of the building as the old paint shop internally to get all the panels to the line to put them on you have to reorganize everything and get the conveyor set up to automatically deliver those panels that's a huge job and it can't be done like over a weekend or while the line is running 
there's a bunch of moving pieces and so it's a very complicated task and that's why we're forced we really don't want to but we're forced to, to take the plant down for three months so that has a big impact uh, on the 2018 model year uh, we intend to start production um, in June uh, and we basically have to go down immediately in August so really there's only a couple of months of production uh, before we go down so the last chance to order and get it built before the downtime is June 12th. So when Buzz was talking about getting excited about well, ordering a car, you know, if you decide uh, you want one, you can't really wait uh, unless you want to get a car uh, very late in the year after the plant comes back up. So uh, very complicated um, uh, execution. The plant has their hands full tremendously uh, to essentially take the plant down, reorganize it, and then bring it back up. Uh, producing the rest of the 2018 model year. So I wanted to give you a little bit of context uh, around that before we get into, because that's probably, you know, on our, what we have, our to-do list, that's our biggest to-do list, is get the plan uh, converted and back up and running again. Um, so we, you know, in spite of that, we still uh, are bringing out some new stuff for 2018, um, and I'll bring Harlan back up to talk about it. So uh, 2018, we got a lot of, uh, of course, uh, we're going to go into the special edition, but we got a lot of other little things that we've done, uh, improvements. Uh, one of the things a lot of people have asked for, uh, the Grand Sport, uh, to be able to get the ceramic brake package without having to go to the full CO7 package. So that's available for 18. On the uh, Stingray, um, the uh, magnetic ride is a you know, standalone option. I'll explain that a little bit separately, but you can get the magnetic ride uh, for a reduced price from what it was. Uh, we brought back uh, HD radio. Uh, we had a lot of people remember we did have it in 2014. Uh, we weren't happy with the you know the, the reception and how that's doing, so we, we, we upgraded uh, some of the antennas and everything like that, so we're able to bring back uh, the HD radio feature. On the performance data recorder, how many people know about the performance data recorder? Oh, good. So performance data recorder, um, is great. The basic uh, onboard car data recorder is the same, but what we were able to do uh, for the Cosworth toolbox is add a few extra channels. So uh, for 18, when you run the toolbox, you'll have you can get some cool things like all four individual wheel speeds, the suspension displacements, the R rate, and intake, and ambient air temperatures. So if you can't live without that, you got to get it. 2018. <laughs> Also, uh, we've improved the rear view camera. It's a uh, better resolution, much improved. And uh, the head-up display, um, this is kind of an interesting one. Most people will never use this feature, but some people, you know, it's one of these things, do you want the head-up display to line up to the world? Do you want it to line up to the hood? Do we have people, you know, debating that? So if you feel it's a little bit off, you can now rotate it and make, make it however you like it. Really? Wow, we're awesome. So for 2018 um, Stingray, um, you know, we've done a lot, we haven't done a lot for the Stingray since it came out, uh, you know, separately. I thought this was a good year to upgrade the Stingray model, and, and we've done that. We've actually, the Stingray now comes standard with the 19 inch front, 20 inch rear wheels. Previously, you had to upgrade to Z51 uh, to get. And the other thing we've done is we added a lot of uh, more wheel options that I'll go to in, in a minute that you can get. So um, hold off on that. Also on the Z06, we've added more wheel options. We've added an additional stripe color for the Grand Sport Heritage. And then we have our new color that you can see outside. We're going to talk about the ceramic uh, matrix gray, which is a very light gray with a metallic with a blue, blue highlights. And that replaces the sterling blue color from 2017. And then we also have the uh, spice red convertible top, which used to be only packaged with that interior. It's, it's a top color that you can just get as an option. So getting back to the Stingray, so on an NA Stingray, even with, without Z51, you can you can get, of course you get the standard sterling silver, but now we have all these wheel choices that you can get. So we think it's kind of exciting, you know, for not, um, for kind of a, not a, a high price, you can get a really, uh, neat looking stingray with, with special wheels. Of course, we have the black machine, the chrome. We have red stripe and yellow stripe. We have some of those outside. We have the torque design wheels that get available from the factory. 
and the motorsport design wheels available from the factory. So you just check the box and get these now on any Stingray. On the Grand Sport, can we continue with the five uh, wheel options? And then on the Z06, we've added the red stripe. We added for 17. We, uh, you can get the yellow stripe wheel, and then we can you can get the pearl nickel uh, blade wheel as well from the factory. Again, these are our uh, 10 colors available. You can see at the bottom is the new uh, ceramic matrix gray. Okay, and uh, we got Ryan here, so let's let him uh, go over all the new interior changes. Thank you, Harlan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll go through with you uh, all the uh, things that are new in interior world for model year 18. So this is kind of a an overview of, of what's going on, and I'll take you through the details. Uh, one thing that changes is uh, the color breakup on a 2LT. So you can see in this schematic that uh, kind of purple color shows where the contrasting color is on all of our different interior breakups, um, which we have quite a few of. And what we're trying to do is make things actually simpler and more consistent. So. Uh, currently, you know, I'm just taking adrenaline red as an example, but it uh, works the same with all the contrasting colors. Uh, in from model year 14 to 17, if you got a 2LT Stingray or a, in this case a Grand Sport, uh, you get the adrenaline red seats and contrasting adrenaline red armrests on the doors and console. For model year 18, the Batwing, the driver's side cockpit shape, also goes in that contrasting color. So this is how a Z06 worked, uh, and now we're making the, uh, the other cars, the Stingray and the Grand Sport, uh, consistent with that. So it'll make it a lot more simple. Um, the color walk up as you go from like a one to a two to a three now works the same across uh, all three models. The uh, accent stitch packages are being enhanced for uh, model year 18. So in this case, uh, on the leather car, so black leather, uh, you can get an accent stitch package, uh, and of course the gray, uh, red, yellow, and uh, now blue. So you can get a blue accent stitch package. The uh, paddles on the steering wheel are still red or yellow if you get the red or yellow stitch package. Uh, this also uh, comes with the FAY low gloss uh, carbon fiber trim on the IP. And the black suede packages are enhanced as well. So this is a black uh, leather interior with black suede on the seat inserts, the door armrests, and those cockpit shapes on the instrument panel and doors. And that now comes in that the same selection of stitch colors. So gray, which we had before, uh, now red, yellow, and the blue stitch. Paddles matched with the red and yellow stitch. And this also comes with the carbon fiber steering wheel. So this is a new feature for model year 18. We've got a carbon 360 degree wrapped carbon fiber rim on the steering wheel. So the upper and lower segments are fully carbon fiber. Uh, it's in high gloss. And so this package comes with the FCC high gloss uh, carbon fiber IP trim as well as bundled together. So this is a, this is a detail showing that interior and each of the stitch colors, so the gray, the red, yellow, yellow paddles, and the blue. And the carbon fiber re wheel is, is a really neat feature. Um, it, it has a very kind of exotic, sporty look to it. Um, it also comes in suede, by the way, so you've got kind of that high gloss carbon and then the low gloss suede with the stitch, accent stitch color on it. It looks really cool. And with that, I will hand it back to Arlen. You know what this is? <laughs> it's 65 years of Corvettes on one slide. So our 2018 is our 65th year. So we were thinking, you know, uh, 65 anniversary, you know, like um, like 25th was like silver, you know, and 50th is gold. Like what is 65? We didn't really know, so we decided just to decree that the 65th anniversary of Corvette is the carbon fiber anniversary. So that's why we did the carbon edition. So the, the Carbon 65 edition, uh, the code for that is, is Z30, you know, we don't have to have a code. And um, 
it's going to be available. Uh, it's available for start of production. And um, you see, the, everybody seen the cars here that we've had? Almost everybody. So you can get it on a, a Z06, a 3LZ Cooper Convertible, or a Grand Sport a 3LT Cooper Convertible. So you can get it on, on either of those cars. And um, it has the new color. Yeah, well, it isn't limited to, it has its own, we're going to have our own VIN to count these, an interior plaque to count these. And it is limited to 650 globally, so it's a very limited uh, production. So it'd be around 450 for the US and 200 export ish around there. Um, it does have uh, unique graphics, uh, it has unique wheels with a machine groove, uh, uh, blue brake calipers. And we put basically all the carbon fiber uh, options that we have today and created some new ones as well. So you get the carbon fiber hood, carbon fiber ground effects, um, carbon fiber interior, the steering wheel that Ryan talked about. The, uh, and we have for new, new that we haven't done before, we have a carbon fiber spoiler uh, on these cars and carbon fiber co rear quarter uh, intakes, which is, which is new. And then we have the interior with the uh, Here's uh, some of the uh, shots that we uh, released recently of the cars. It's a Z06 Coupe. And the two that we have here, we, these are the only two that exist as of right now. And we have a Z06 Coupe. And the only real options are you get the transmission and the Z07 package as an option or ceramic brake option. Otherwise, it comes with every, everything else. And then we have the, the Grand Sport convertible here as well. Here's the Grand Sport convertible. Now these are, uh, Kirk Bennion will be here later, our exterior design manager. These are some of his early sketches they put together. And this is the, uh, this is the Grand Sport version. And see, um, this is his early sketches deciding, you know, how to do the, um, the graphics. And one of the neat graphics too, it's kind of subtle, but I think a lot of people will like it on the coupe. You can see the graphic with the gloss black. It connects the carbon fiber to the rear window. Kind of creates that graphic. I think it really gives it a nice, a nice look as well. And here's the Z06 version. Okay. All right. Here's some of the details. Uh, again, wheels. Uh, the Grand Sport gets uh, cup wheels with a machine group. And the uh, Z06 version gets the, what we call the blade wheels. Again, black with machine roof. There's special sill blades. Uh, those are the, for the first time, we have these carbon fiber uh, quarter ducts. We have the uh, blue brakes and accents, which brings out the blue highlights in the color and the carbon uh, logo on the wheel caps. Of course, the fender graphics and the new uh, carbon uh, rear spoiler. Okay, let's get Ryan back to talk about the carbon 65 interior. So the Carbon 65, uh, as Harlan said, obviously the emphasis on carbon fiber, it's a very, uh, it gives the car kind of a very serious feel to it. So we use the uh, black leather and black suede interior for this car. Uh, so the suede uh, brake up with the suede cockpit seats, um, it's got the competition seats in it as well, and the blue stitch to tie into the, uh, into the exterior uh, col uh, stripe color. So we've also got the carbon fiber rim steering wheel with the blue stitching suede wheel. The uh, FCC high gloss carbon fiber IP trim as well because the wheels are high gloss so they have to match uh, the new combination of black leather, black suede, and the blue stitch. And we've got IP plaques as well. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here that uh, we're trying to get a little bit better about is uh, typically when we do a, a special edition, we do a special edition plaque for the IP and then that's, that's the identity of that plaque. So, um, if you get a Grand Sport or if you get a Z06, um, you don't get a Grand Sport or a Z06 plaque, you get a special edition plaque. So in this case, we're combining them. So if you order a Grand Sport, you get a Grand Sport plaque, but it's carbon 65. So it has carbon 65 on it, and it's got the build number. So you're not your build number out of 650 total. Same thing for, for Z06. So you can still get a Z, if you order a Z06, you get a Z06 plaque. 
but it's a carbon 65 Zeno 6 plug. So you don't lose the identity of the, of the vehicle itself. Another hand off band. <laughs> Okay, well, you guys can, uh, can come back up, actually. Um, that's kind of the end of our uh, prepared uh, presentation today, but uh, I hope you can see, even though, you know, we've got the paint shop going, a lot of renewal going, uh, we're still trying to bring out uh, new stuff uh, for you all. Uh, even though 65 to a lot of people means uh, retirement age, for us, it's a new beginning. We're, we're just getting rolling, and we want to keep rolling and uh, keep bringing out uh, new stuff that'll uh, keep the whole Corvette community alive and interested in, uh, in our products. And so uh, we'll be back again next year and for the foreseeable future uh, bringing new stuff to you. So that's it for today, but uh, we're happy to take uh, questions and answers. We've got quite a lot of time here. We'd be happy to entertain them. You guys can come up too. All right, who's got the first question? You know what? We always start in the front. Let's start towards the back. Go ahead. <coughs> question is, can you update the PDR software? We get this question every year, and honestly, I don't know. And the answer is, as usual, no, sorry. <laughs> because a lot of times there's hardware and software that goes together, and so I've talked about this. You know, we could uh, decide we want everything to be back serviceable and not change the hardware, but it would limit the amount of improvement that we could make. And so, uh, we, in general, we say, you know what, we're not going to let back serviceability uh, keep us from making the, the feature or the car as good as it could be. Okay. We don't have a question, we have a demand. <laughs> the demand is that we never remove the, the manual transmission. And then, I assume you all own a current manual transmission. Thank you for your business. Would it be okay? Let me ask you a question. Would it be okay if the automatic became standard and we charge you an arm and a leg for me? I'm getting a mixed response from that. For him, it's yes. Okay. All right. But we, we, we hear you. <laughs> okay, another question. Dan? So there's a giant new building over there, and the question is, what percentage of it is paint shop? And the answer is 100. 100 percent. You don't believe me, you're laughing at me, but uh, would I lie to you? In this case, I'm not lying to you. It is 100 percent a paint shop, and we will have uh, videos, actually, video tours, and we hope long term for the first time uh, public tours, when we get the tours going again, the paint shop's online, up and running. We haven't thought about it. It's the only time in history, in GM history, said, you know, what if we could bring uh, people who are touring the plant through the paint shop? Typically, you can't do that because it's a clean room environment. Uh, you have to go undergo a bunch of testing. You can't use deodorant. There's all sorts of things. You cannot go in the paint shop without all sorts of uh, unusual prep. Um, so it's a closed area. But we have tried to orchestrate uh, places where you can peek in and windows where you can look in and see it. So we're hoping to show that. But uh, like I said, it's because it's custom design for composite panels. The paint ovens are enormously long, just incredible. And we space the panels out on what we call a scuff. That's the fixture that holds all the panels in positions for the robots to paint. It's as big as a suburban. So you essentially have a suburban going through the paint shop very slowly, and it's going through at low temperatures, because uh, that doesn't disturb the composite. So believe it or not, and I know people probably won't believe me, uh, 
but it's, it's true. The paint shop, when you see that old building, is all dedicated to paint. I believe you. <laughs> oh, I believe it's me. He's been there. We walked through it. It's true. It's true. Uh, all dedicated to paint. Okay, way in the back. Next question. <laughs> How far away is the C8? It's uh, definitely in the future. So, uh, it just keeps coming to the bash year after year after year, and eventually uh, we'll, there'll be a C8 we can talk about. Okay. You asked a question already. I will break behind you back there. But another question about future product is asking about uh, ZR1. Obviously, we can't talk about any future product, uh, any future models. We're talking about 2018 today, and like I say, just keep coming back here. And uh, if we do have things to announce, we'll talk about them in detail here. Way back. A quick. Here. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, I didn't know who you're for too. Uh, did, was there a specific reason to get rid of the 18 and 19 inch wheels for Stingray? I thought it was a great looking wheel. It gave us a little more diversity in the brand and a different ride, ride quality and you know, just kind of expanded everything. I think we're narrowing it a little bit with that wheel. I didn't know if there was a reason to change that or just simply to change the aesthetics. I think the question was around why did why we get rid of 18 and 19? We, we, we found that, you know, um, early on, you know, that everybody loved the, the larger wheels on the Corvette. We just thought it would be a great way to upgrade the Stingray. You know, we've been out for, it's our fifth year now. We wanted to really upgrade the appearance and make it uh, a little bit more affordable for people to get a, a car that doesn't look like a base car that looks like an up-level car standard. And, and honestly, uh, my father's an example of this. He bought a Z51 not because he was going to track it, because he wanted the big wheels. So, you know, he could get whatever he wanted. He just liked the big wheels. So now he has all the other content that he doesn't need as part of Z51. He's got more aggressive brakes, so more brake dust. So he's trading one problem for another. He'd much rather have what we're now offering, big wheels, but the standard brakes. So really, it's a customer pull. And you know how much extra it costs? $45. <laughs> Okay, in the blue now. Okay. Is the plan to produce all 650 carbon cars before the shutdown? You're going to have to step up into the aisle for us to hear you. Okay. Is the plan to produce all 650 of the carbon cars before the shutdown, or are you going to do some before and some after? The question is, uh, the carbon 65, are we going to produce them all before the shutdown? We'll produce them to order. If we get enough orders, enough customers who want them before shutdown, we can produce them before shutdown. But we'll be able to continue uh, producing them after shutdown if people still want it. I don't think so. I think they won't, we will not have any before shutdown, most likely. Yeah, yeah, most likely. There'll, be some, there'll be a good portion. We want to get as many as we can before, but there'll be some after. Go ahead. We usually don't try to predict volumes, you know, it's just, it's a losing battle. Sometimes we make more than we expect, sometimes less. You know, the plant's essentially rated at the capacity that we've been producing, but we can fluctuate up and down uh, to meet market demand, whatever that is. Typically at this time in the program, you know, we introduced the car in 14, now we're starting our 18th, so fifth model year. You typically see a, a product like the Corvette, you know, it's very hot for a few years, you see the volume taper off. So we plan for that kind of volume decay. Uh, it's not really a big deal. The question was also about, uh, are we delaying new models because of the shutdown? And the answer to that is no. Uh, we are trying to make sure that the plant has a minimum amount of churn while they go through this process. So changing the car like during model year 18, like right before the shutdown or right after, we're not doing much of that. But there would not be a change in major model uh, reveals or delivery or anything because of that. Okay.
question is 100 octane cal uh, available for uh, grand sport. I do not believe we have any plans to do that. It's not really necessary. George, do you have a question? asking about a, do you want a DCT manual transmission? You just want a DCT. Why do you want it? Sophistication of shipping. Well, this, this car, you know, we got the two transmission choices. Uh, we're really lucky, you know, you've asked the question about the manual before. Uh, many people are walking away from that and just offering a, a single transmission. Uh, we're happy that we can do the seven speed manual, the eight speed automatic. Uh, typically doing an all-new transmission. Uh, there, there's not a, a DCT that exists in the world that will plug and play into this car. Can't take the power, can't take the torque, won't fit in the package. Uh, and you know, we can't do a unique transmission um, just for Corvette. Other questions? Yeah, the white back here. Something about C7 on the race car or the? Yeah, on the race car. How, how much does that influence the design of the car? Oh, okay. Um, well, when we introduced the Stingray, we talked a lot about that. How the uh, C6R uh, introduced or generated a lot of ideas on design innovations. And that's why we have like the rear quarter ducts and the dip and trans cooler in the back, whereas they'd always been on the front. And we have the pathway that goes through the top of the quarter. And, out the back of the car. So we're always looking to take the race car solutions and see if we can apply them. Uh, it really goes both ways. We try to make a better street car that's more applicable, a better starting point uh, for the race car. So now that the C7R is out there and has been out there for a few years, we're staying really, really tight uh, with the race team to see what uh, of any of the technology advancements uh, they're using we can apply to future Corvette models. So that, that's kind of an ongoing thing. If you hear Doug Feehan talking about it, he talks about it as cascade engineering. Race car helps street car get better, better street cars, better starting point for a race car. That race car is more competitive, makes more advancements, which then goes right back to the street car. We've been doing that now uh, for generations of Corvette, and it's going to continue. Yes, sir. Question is about the 10 speed automatic that's uh, recently been introduced in the Camaro. Um, that transmission does not fit in a Corvette. That transmission was um, basically a paper study when we were uh, starting the development work on the seventh generation car. And so none of the Corvette requirements, which main ones are around packaging, uh, were applied to that transmission. And so it, uh, we don't see that transmission going into the Corvette. And in fact, uh, eight speeds is a lot. When I first started, we had our four speed automatic and everybody thought that was awesome. And uh, then we went to the six speed and honestly, in engineering, we thought, wow, six speeds. We're never gonna want more than six speeds. You got a really flexible engine, it's got a lot of low end torque. And there's a point where the car spends all its time shifting and not driving. And so um, we're getting to the point and people are talking crazy numbers uh, of transmission speeds, and uh, it eventually evolves into not a technical requirement, but a marketing one. It's one up and ship. You know, it's your transmission to have four gears in mind. So uh, there, there comes a point of diminishing returns in terms of number of ratios in the transmission. And more ratios means bigger box, more money, more complicated, more mass. So uh, there's some downsides to that escalation as well. What, any more in the back? Yes, ma'am. Questions about accident prevention technology. Okay, um, so uh, you see a lot about autonomous and starting to take the responsibility of driving away from the driver. Uh, there's a big move afoot. You know, people are doing adaptive cruise control now, and uh, you know, lane assist and all this stuff that uh, essentially reduces the workload for the drivers so you can spend more time texting. And so. <laughs> We, you know, we're kind of the antithesis of that. We assume you buy this car because you enjoy driving it. And so we try to provide all the information you need as the driver uh, to do the right thing. Um, 
you know, we have heard uh, requests. We brought the car out uh, for side blind zone because other Chevrolet products have it. Um, thought about that. It's really hard in this architecture because we have big key changers in the back or quarters where the sensors go. And um, so we take that input in, and we're not going to be the people who, you know, are moving as far to the extreme of taking the, the driving responsibility out of the driver's hands. Um, but we'll put, you know, we put a lot of safety uh, consideration in the Corvette, everything that has to do uh, with your safety and accidents. We've got a lot of uh, safety features. And actually, inside General Motors, Corvette's not exempt from all the ex extra, you know, not federal, not global requirements, but General Motors has its own safety standards that are much, much higher than what's legally required. And all of those get applied to Corvette as well. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. OK, here. good. Go to you next. Go back. Sorry, I didn't hear. the options mentioned the gas guzzler tax I'm not quite sure what there's a well a, Z, a Z06 with the eight speed automatic that's that's a gas guzzler tax that's that's all it is that's the only one that gets it though all none of the other four that models get it and it doesn't sound like it should be it's a weird thing it doesn't sound like it should be an option if it's an option I would just pick no I don't want it <laughs> so it's not really an option but they it's something they make us list that you know that option on the option list. There you go. Okay, we'll come back to you now. <coughs> Actually, all C7 Corvettes with manuals have paddles on the steering wheels, and that's to actuate the rev matching. Um, it's a system that that flips the throttle for you. It matches the engine speed to your road speed. It actually, it's either on downshifts or upshifts. So um, some people don't want the car doing that for them. They want a traditional three-pedal manual, the way it's always been. You're responsible for matching the engine revs to your road speed. So that's, that's the default. That's the way the car starts. Uh, but if you want it to rev match, and there's times, even on the racetrack, uh, where you may really be desperate to have a really clean downshift and uh, that system gives you that without the driver being responsible so um, even our best drivers now at GM who spend their lives on track with manual transmission they're the best heel towers you ever saw they use the rev matching now um, on track so those paddles because if you drive it on the street there's times where you just like to drive it yourself and other times where it's handy to have a, a rev match feature um, like when I drive a manual, I find that I'm turning it on and off depending on the traffic situation. So that's why we made it very convenient and put it right on the steering wheel. Yeah, it's not tied to it. It's, it's always there. It's always accessible. You can do it no matter what other mode the car is in. Yes, sir. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I, how many people saw Kai's presentation yesterday? A lot of people. Um, I'll just, I can't do it as well as he did, but to summarize, he went over a lot of information on how, uh, because of the new paint job, I can't say the plant, this has a lot of rearrangement, the general assembly, the body area, he's talking about how it goes, and he makes his one that says, so we're rearranging all this uh, stuff, we're not really mapping out the ideal plant tour route yet. So it's just, you know, it's like, all those changes happening um, couldn't give us a time, you know, and you don't have a time table yet when we'd be able to resume, re resume that those type of activity. So, yeah, so unfortunately we don't have the, uh, for 18, we don't have the tours, we don't have the engine bill program as well. As well. We do still have museum delivery though, so don't, we still do museum delivery. And the bottom line is, um, we know people really like to tour. It's a big tourist destination in all of Kentucky. Even people who don't know or care that much about Corvettes, they like to come into a manufacturing facility like that. So it is really popular, and we know there's a lot of pressure. It's really, you know, 
We will bring it back as soon as we can, but uh, safety, you know, the job one is getting the plan rearranged, getting the car in production, doing what that plan has to do. Um, another consideration is safety of the tours. Like Carlin was saying, you got a bunch of moving equipment around, uh, a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen when. So we want to get back to tours. It's just not the highest priority. We don't want to pretend like it's going to be really quick that as soon as we bring the plant back up that people can walk through. So that's why we put that date out there. Other questions? Question is why doesn't what we call a latch over an ignition cycle? Why does not weather mode latch? Uh, we consider weather a, a somewhat unusual mode. Um, I've been here at the birthday bash, and as soon as it rains, everybody takes off and finds a place for their car. You know, they don't want to leave it out in the rain. So we typically don't expect uh, customers to spend a lot of time uh, in bad weather, and so we don't want to really have the car compromised the way it's compromised in weather mode with people not really thinking about it. So we consider it a, a low use case. That's what we call a low use case mode, and that's why we revert to something that's more to the more standard. Yes, sir. Are you asking if blue calipers will be available as a, like a free flow option choice? Yeah, the, the blue calipers are really specially for this Carbon 65 Special Edition right now, so they're not available as a free flow. It's kind of special for that car. How many people would have checked the box for blue calipers if they could free express? I'm glad you would. <laughs> Anybody else? Seriously? Seriously? Okay, we got a scattering of hands. Okay, so that'd be your favorite. If people raise their hands. It's not that you think blue would be nice. It would be better than the other choices that we have. All right, thanks. Well, we're always looking for uh, customer feedback, so you know that's why we come to events like this is to hear you guys and try to do. You know, we can't do everything for everybody. It's it's way too complicated. But when we have kind of a critical mass of people requesting something, uh, we really try to make that happen. Yes, sir. Um, question is, do, have we, do we feel intimidated by Chrysler's horsepower numbers? <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like, you know, Chrysler discontinued the Viper, and now it looks like um, they're looking for a different avenue to make headlines, and so they're headed to the drag strip. You know, first the Hellcat, now the Demon. Um, when we talk about a car that comes out that has uh, the capability, um, the horsepower, it's, what we talk about is what comes out of the bullet refactory, not what you can accessorize. So the demon that you hear about is you know, the, the very impressive quarter mile times, 840 horsepower, that's not what comes out of the factory. You have to buy aftermarket performance accessories uh, to get that. So they're doing everything they can uh, to get those headlines. And, you know, we try to do very well-rounded cars, so, uh, you know, maybe we don't have the same horsepower numbers, part, partly, honestly, because uh, we're a very small car. You just can't fit a big engine. The car would be very unbalanced if we put a big motor like that uh, in the front. You also wouldn't be able to see out of it. The hood would have to be so high. You wouldn't be able to see anything. So uh, we're trying to put well-rounded cars, and we don't really... Uh, worry too much about what, what any other individual competitor has done. You know, if they put that miter motor in a Viper, you know, that was really competitive in other ways, that would probably make us stand up and take notice, but uh, to put it in these big muscle cars, um, it's not really a competitor for us. Yeah, I was at a, a track day about three weeks ago now with my uh, Z51, and I spent way too much time stuck behind Hellcats. 
So they, they just do not want, you know, they, they are set up for the drag to Ted's point about being a well-rounded car. You know, they, they're set up for the drag strip and that's about it. So doing anything else, even on the streets or certainly on a track, on a road course, they're, they're kind of out of their element for sure. I happened to be there at the time and it was pretty comical to watch this guy who would not uh, pull over and let anybody by because he was the fastest in the straightaway. You get to the straightaway, he'd fly down, you know, tons of noise, and then he'd get to the next corner, and then there'd be a big parade behind him. Everybody would be lining up, <laughs> waiting for him to get around the corner, and he'd sort of saw his way around the corner, then wide open throttle, and, you know, the drag race. So, yeah, it's a completely different kind of car. It's, it really doesn't belong on a, any kind of road course track. It belongs on drag strip. Okay. Yes, sir. I think the question was the the bid op. Ah, where you can yeah, that that's available. That continues to be available. If you want if you want a specific bin, you have to get it to us. though before obviously we build it. So yeah, that's still available for uh, ongoing. Question is, are we ever going to have a uh, Corvette Experience Center? Um, well, you're close to sitting in one right now. We have a track right across the way, but it's pretty cool. I think we're the only company in the world where you have a museum, an actual factory, and a track. Uh, so you can see that we're building something here. Uh, it's a long-term commitment. We don't have any specific plans around the uh, at Experience Center. They'd probably love to have you go to Spring Mountain you know, that would be an awesome way to experience the car. Go to Spring Mountain, get the driver training, you get to experience the Corvettes there on the racetrack. Uh, it's an awesome program. Uh, but right now we don't have any plans to, to set something like that up here. We have tried to do uh, drive events at certain, uh, we haven't done as much recently, but especially with the same way came out, we did, a, we did a, quite a few uh, special driving events, get people in. But I think it is a good thing that we have to expand on going forward. It's, they are expensive, but yeah, it's good. I, I would just say that um, there, there is actually quite a bit of work going on uh, at GM regarding the overall customer experience for Corvette, and how do we make sure that we're really upping our game there. And uh, we've seen things like the Porsche Experience Center. Um, yeah, I, would we be able to do something exactly like that? Don't really know, but it is something that um, we're looking at and uh, it really helps to hear that feedback directly and it helps us go back and take that back and say, look, this is something customers really care about. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> Question is, there's cars going around the Nürburgring. You are right. <laughs> there are cars going around the Nervous. Yes, back here. Back here. I think the question is does the new paint shop offer more flexibility in terms of? the kind of colors, the, the options. Um, I don't think we've announced anything yet, but we're trying to put in place uh, you know, a more premium uh, process there that would let us do something more special than we're doing now. We don't have anything to announce uh, right now, but uh, it'll, it'll depend a lot on uh, customer pull, but we're, the facility itself is capable of doing more than the current paint shop. Yeah. Question is, uh, could we do, uh, this is actually related to the other one, so I'm asking about the, the brake dust that you get on performance brakes. Um, it, it's universal, it's around the world, it's the state of the art in uh, brake that doesn't matter if it's on a Porsche or an Audi or anything. Uh, if you have high performance brakes, uh, you get dust and that gets on the wheels. One easy solution is buy ceramics. You know, it's not cheap, but uh, it does uh, help tremendously uh, with the dust. 
Uh, the whole world is working on that exact problem. You know, how do you do high performance uh, brake pads um, and not have as much dust? Unfortunately, regulators are also making it more challenging. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, several states have decreed that uh, you can't use copper in uh, brake pads. Um, and so you, know, you don't think of copper as, copper seems to be, to be benign, but uh, they've decided they don't want to use copper in brake pads because it sloughs off as part of that, that dust that's up in the water. I don't think we're a big source of that, but uh, there are regulations now in the books where we have to take copper out, and copper is a pretty big component of uh, brake pads. So this is an example of the kind of thing we face all the time, where we're trying to make the car better and better, and then some uh, regulator somewhere in the world decides, well, we're gonna take away something, uh, an option for you to try to make cars better, and actually is a huge challenge uh, to replace copper or find something else in brake pads, and even keep the performance that we have. So. Uh, Brake pads are kind of a black art. There's a, a kind of a witch's brew of materials in there to get the performance that they have. Uh, and like I said, everybody around the world is trying to uh, inter, you know, invent a better mousetrap on, on brake pads. So um, we recognize the issue. Uh, I'd love to not have to clean my wheels every day um, when I'm driving cars with uh, performance pads on. So. One thing you mentioned that ceramic brakes which really helps eliminate that problem. You know what? For a limited time, as of right now, there's actually a five thousand dollar discount on Corvettes with ceramic brakes. So either uh, you know the Z07 option or the Z06 with the J57 option. So if you're hurry and you're really interested in that, that's quite a good deal for that option. It is. In fact, if you think, I think if you look across all manufacturers who offer ceramic brakes with that discount, it's the least expensive way to get into ceramic brakes in the world, which is a huge deal because it really is a very, very high technology. And we don't have the smallest ceramic brakes. We have about the biggest ceramic brakes. We've got uh, very nice size, very, very powerful, very capable brakes. Any more? Okay. Question is, have we done any research on inboard brakes? Um, that would be a packaging nightmare uh, for us. Um, I know some race cars uh, have used it, um, but the answer is no. It really, from a technical standpoint, on a street car, really not practical. You can see our race car doesn't even do it. How about the back corner there? Question is, why doesn't AFM work on idle? because you would hate it. Um, he's asking about AFM, so that's four-cylinder mode where two cylinders in each bank are operating. And uh, we did look at that, and at that low engine speed, we idle way down at uh, you know, five, a little over 500 RPM. When you're running on only four cylinders, the shaking forces are so great, it just feels like the car is broken. So down the road at higher engine revs, it's pretty well balanced. But when you're getting so few firing pulses at idle, it really, it, and it doesn't get you much fuel economy because we idle so low. If, if you want to make it halfway decent, four cylinder, you have to bump the idle speed up and you lose all your fuel economy benefits. So there really is not a benefit to it. Yeah. That was a paint shop question, but I couldn't tell what the, Okay, that's related to the customization, uh, paint a sample. Just curious, how many people uh, would like to paint a sample? That means you provide a sample color and we paint it to match that color. How many people would like that? Okay. How many people would like it at $20,000? <laughs> I think Porsche charges 10 or 12 or something to do that. So it looks like all the hands went thin. You're staying up. 4,000? How many at 4,000? Really? Okay. Five. Those are five. <laughs> we're going to keep going up with only one hand, and then we're going to do it. This is like Sarah Jackson all of a sudden. So I'd be curious, the people who raised your hand for a custom color, what color do you want that we don't have? So some of you are, are talking 
talking about colors that we have had in our palette before. How, how, What'd you say? Full flame orange, okay. And um, you can tell color is obviously a very polarizing choice. Uh, it's, it's difficult to um, give everybody what they want. You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, in Ryan in the interior studio and in the exterior studio. It's extremely complicated uh, to figure out, you know, what are the best combinations of colors. We have tons of people that raise their hand at these events and say, you know, green. I heard a couple of people say green. Since I've been on Corvette, I think we've tried three or four greens. It's just bomb every time. Even where people said, oh, I love that color. In fact, we had a green when he introduced the C7. And it looked awesome. Green. And, uh, but it, the sales just dive to the point where, you know, if they have one or two percent, you're managing all the green parts. We paint a lot of them here at the paint shop, but we also buy a lot of them, so we have to keep things like mirrors in the inventory, and it just doesn't pencil as a, as a business case. So when colors taper off to zero, even though you might have a couple of people that are passionate about it, you just can't afford to keep it in the system. You're tying up you know, a big chunk of your paint capacity on a color that people hardly ever order. So um, you know, it's, it's a difficult business situation for us. Maybe we should move on from color. <laughs> yes, sir. You're wondering about five years. What does our warranty thing say about engine durability? What durability improvements? Actually, uh, aside from supplier quality spills, just making the engine the same every time, there haven't really been a bunch of design changes. The small block is an uh, inherently robust engine. We built millions of them for trucks. We do a different version for Corvette, but many of the engines are processed the same way. They, they meet the same standards. So we have a, a unique ability because the Corvette pushes the performance edge high speed and the track capability, those stresses on the engine. And the truckers, you know, they want high torque, long durability, towing capability. So the design team that has to put together the engine design has to consider those bookends of the use, use cases, we call them, the duty cycles. And so that bakes a lot of durability into the fundamental engine. That's why you see, you know, we sell a lot of crate motors. You see Corvette engines being used in all sorts of applications, not even non-automotive. Uh, somebody was telling me they were in Florida and there was an offshore boat and they had three LT4s mounted vertically as outboard engines. Um, as you can imagine that, three LT4s were along the back of the boat. So they find applications in, in, in lots of places just because it's, uh, it's an extremely robust engine. Okay. Yes. Who was telling you that you can put it in track mode? You want to make sure you're managing your shifts depending on the temperature, but yeah, you can put it in track mode. It just depends on the driver, the temperature, the track, there's a whole bunch of it depends on the year. We made some upgrades this last year in the automatic on the I assume you're talking CO6. Oh you are? Oh, C51? That hasn't been a big issue. Who said that? Who told you that? <laughs> Name names. <laughs> some guy. Okay, some guy said it. Did it overheat? Did it shut you down? Did you get a warning light or anything? But it didn't hit the red. So you were fine. Right, it'll send you a warning. If it's overheated, it'll, it'll let you know. There'll be a, a message in the driver information center. The shift patterns are different. That's the main reason. But you can shift it, you can, you can shift it manually and control it exactly how you want. Yeah? <laughs> Did you have fun on the track?
Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go on. It has 
exact same control. It does. You have a you have a, a subject. Yeah, you don't have, you don't have eight way in your passenger seat. All right, make sure you check. If you don't have it, you have an extremely valuable car. <laughs> because we're always supposed to build one like that. It should have, it should be a mirror image driver and passenger seat. It's the same though, all here on one LT. If you only get on one LT, you don't have the lumbar and the wings, but you still have eight way power. Every core driver has eight way power. Starting with one four to your nine. So find one of us, go back and you check your car. We'll be here all weekend and find one of us that we really seem to have that, we'd love to look at it. <laughs> okay, you're on the corner. Two thousand, well, we have a Michelin here. Is Michelin still here? Right here. I'd talk to the Michelin guys about that. You want to answer the question? The question was, will we have uh, all season tires available for CO6 in 2018? We're going to try to have some uh, all-season tires for the, uh, the 20s. At the end of 2017, we'll have all-season tires for the CO6 and more silence for a question for a current car. Five minutes, question mark. So if I heard Lee right, end of this year, the wide by so Brand Sport and CO6, there will be availability for Michelin. And, yes. In about a month or two, we'll have Okay, they're also going back to C6. Okay, in a month or two, right? Yes. So this summer. And this wasn't the oh, question. December. This wasn't the exact question, but I drove all winter uh, Z06. I drove my Z06 all winter up in Michigan with the uh, Michelin uh, Alpine tires, the winter tires. Awesome. No issues. Felt very confident. It worked great. So that's another option, you know, use those in the winter and switch back to up tires for the summer. Yeah. Something that uh, 
A lot of cars have. Um, I guess how many people would like that turn signal function on the side mirror? So that's where you, it's called a side repeater, so you also get the flashing. You know, the plus side is that, you know, people up alongside of you can see it, you can see it. It makes the mirror a little bigger, it puts extra features, extra wiring going through the door. There's a bunch of downsides to it. Um, we try to keep our mirrors as compact as they can be. That's why we have uniquely, a lot of people don't do this, uh, we uniquely have domestic mirrors, so mirror size for domestic usage, and then export mirrors that are quite a bit bigger. It's an example of the regulations in this country don't match the regulations around the world. And if you want to do one that meets both regulations, the mirrors get really quite large. So we're always trying to keep the mirrors as small as, you know, it's a relatively small car. You don't want these big, you know, billboard mirrors on the side of it. It doesn't look good and you don't need them. So we uh, try to keep the mirror very compact. It's good for aerodynamics too. Mirrors cause drag, they also cause noise. So them being small is, is a really good thing from a, the driver's perspective. So. But we have heard that from uh, some folks along with the, the side blind zone, that that would be a, a preference. Yes, sir. So that's a, uh, the question is about putting the the extra little mirror, like the wide angle view mirror, so you can see the, the blind spot. I'd be curious, you know, that's got pluses and minuses. The plus is that you can see that. The downside is it's a little more complicated to read. You have to look at two different places. And the, some people find that um, extreme wide angle a little bit confusing on the face of the mirror. I'd be curious how many people would like that, because you can buy an aftermarket uh, piece of it. So we got a few people, a few takers, okay. All right, thanks, that's good input. The light, yes. That's the side blind, so we call it. Okay. Yes. Okay, well I think we're getting close to winding up here. I see some people start to trickle out. Maybe just one or two more questions. Yes, sir. You're talking about the EC mirror, electrochromatic mirror, and it's a, it's pretty much the same reason that your uh, widescreen TV at a home has a bezel around it, you actually have to, you know, there's liquid crystals across the face of it and you have to charge them. There's connections around the perimeter, so just like TVs, we're trying to make those thinner and smaller, thinner and smaller, but there still is a little bit of a, a band around there. Okay, last one. Yes, sir. It's upgraded. It's actually a pretty nice upgrade uh, for this year, but its uh, angle of view is, is focused on curves and it's down pretty low. Uh, the question, I don't know if everybody heard it, is uh, could we have that operate on a racetrack? We have a prohibition on showing moving images while the car is driving forward. That's why it flanks out uh, when you're going forward. You're talking about geofencing, so it'll only work when you're theoretically off-road. Uh, that's a fairly complex thing, and it's um, not really in keeping with the requirements that we operate under. We can't have moving images while you're driving forward for driver distraction reasons. And that's General Motors. It's, I think it's actually a legal requirement, but there's other people like Tesla who go ahead and do it. Um, but that's an example of where they're doing something we think is actually kind of illegal, but they're selling it and they're, it's not getting forced on them. So, you know, it's, I think it's kind of a cool idea. I, I'd like to see it, but I can understand the driver distraction side of it too. Okay, well, I think we're gonna, we got another group coming, I think the race team's coming in uh, in a little while. So I appreciate all you guys coming up. Really appreciate